I had always wanted to join the military. I just felt like it was really part of my duty. Something that I'd wanted to do was to uh, give back to my country, to serve my country. I don't think anybody necessarily instilled that in me, but somewhere along the way, um, that, that was what I wanted to do. My mom and dad were both in the Air Force, and my dad was an air traffic controller. So in 1970, he got tired of working at uh, Barksdale Air Force Base at the radar approach control and at the municipal airport there in Shreveport. And so he kind of wanted, he was kind of ready to go into semi-retirement. So he transferred to Tyler Pounds Field. So we moved back out uh, in the country south of Jacksonville, uh, where he grew up, uh, built a house out there, moved back out there in uh, the summer of 1970. During my junior year, uh, I, don't, I think I had heard a Marine recruiter, saw him in his dress blues, I thought, that's a nice uniform. And so somewhere along the way, I had decided that the Marine Corps was gonna be the branch that I joined. My dad was upset with me. Uh, in fact, I was 17 when I signed up and my dad wouldn't sign the paperwork. So my mom forged his signature, not that anybody will ever know that, but uh, my dad wanted me to stay home and go to school down at Stephen F. Austin in Nacogdoches. And I was like, I'm tired of school. I wanna join the Marine Corps. I don't wanna go to school anymore. So I joined the Marine Corps and I went to school for almost two years after that. I, I went to boot camp in September, 1973. Got to Paris Island, scared the mess out of me. When uh, the bus pulled up, these everybody stands up and stands at attention, you know, try and press these drill instructors that get on the bus. And they just ripped us anew and told us to sit down, shut up, told us what we were gonna do, and then told us to get off the bus. It was a scary time. <laughs> sir, sir, sir. Vietnam was still going on, and actually, uh, you know, that was kind of one of the reasons I joined. It was, you know, I thought maybe it's my my uh, part to to go and fight for my country. Fortunately, I didn't have to go. It was all still going on when we were in boot camp. We were we were still doing our training and everything, as if you know some of us were going to go, you know, get sent to Vietnam. Uh, fortunately, I was not one of them. Uh, there were a group of four or five of us that call, got called out to go for an interview with some guy there. So we went over and we talked to him. It was an interview process, I guess, looking at ASVAB scores or whatever. I scored halfway decent in whatever areas they were looking at. They had asked me to be a, a Morris or a non-Morris intercept operator. I think all but one of us accepted the, the offer to go into that field. I worked for a Naval Security Group for my 20 years in the Corps. Our school was in Pensacola, Florida, and initially I was going there as a Morris intercept operator. I remember watching one of our instructors one time playing cards, drinking coffee, and copying Morse code at 20 plus groups per minute. I'd he'd sit there and hold the deck of cards, take a drink of coffee, put his cards down, type for a minute, and he did better at Morse code copying twice as fast as I did than I could sitting there focusing and concentrating on it. And so I, I worked on it though. I tried and I tried and I tried. And finally they said, okay, you're not gonna make it. So they put me over in the non-Morse code. And then from Pensacola, I went to Camp Geiger in North Carolina. Part of our job was uh, operations security or ComSec, communications security. So we would go out and we would listen to them for a little bit and figure out their net structure, who their, who their headquarters element was, and then who each of the, you know, the companies or the platoons or whatever off that, listening to their call signs. And we'd graph it all out so we'd know who was who. Uh, and then we'd start breaking into their nets. So we would get them going to different places where they weren't supposed to be. We could jam you know, one side and talk to the other and then switch, jam the other side and talk to the other guys. And by doing that, like I can say, we could, we could get them spread out all over the place. As a German linguist, I went on a NATO exercise. And so we took uh, a Jeep and uh, radio and a, and a noisemaker out with us. And we just went out and, and listening to the Germans and, and doing the same thing that we did to the Americans. We would, we would map out their, their net structure and then we would break into their nets. If you're talking to one side, you don't want the other side to hear you talking to the, the guys they were just talking to and you claiming to be them, uh, so you jam them so they can't hear, to jam one side and then talk to the other. 
Um, that way they, they can't hear you claiming to be them. So we did that to the Germans and they actually had to, they had to stop the exercise for about two hours while all the German troops got back together to where they were supposed to be. We had them, we had them spread out all over the countryside. So. And then after the exercise was all over, we'd come back in and we would go tell them, this is what happened and this is why. Again, trying to teach them the importance of, of security while they're on a clear radio channel. I got promoted, so I got short toured and uh, ended up going back to Pensacola and studying electronics intelligence, which was radars. Ended up going to Cherry Point, North Carolina after that, working with the air wing there with uh, EA-6Bs, electronic warfare bird. It was always easy to tell the EA-6Bs from the regular EA-6s because the Bs were a four-seater and they had a big thing on the tail called a football. We call it a football, uh, but it's where some of the receivers and stuff were. But uh, the EA-6Bs would go out and uh, record everything that was out there. In particular, they were looking, we were looking for radars is what we were looking for, but you know, they, they basically just sucked up everything and then brought it back. Guys would go out and pull the tape off the aircraft and they would bring it to us. We would put it on our computer system and then start uh, breaking it down and looking at it and uh, throwing out all the things that we, we didn't want to look at. And then we would go back and start breaking down some of the things that we did want to look at. From our listening posts, you know, the ones that I was at, Guam, Homestead, Okinawa, uh, Edsel, Scotland, from those places, and, and we had others around the world, but we would pretty much just listen to everybody. We worked out of vans, uh, mobile vans, where we could hook them up to a deuce and a half or back then the gamma goats or whatever, and we would go out in the field then in, in these vans so we could sit inside a, a van and do our job in there and keep it classified. And we would have to set up a compound out there and we would put um, strands of concertina wire around our compound and only have one, e one entrance and exit, uh, one way in and out. And because we always had classified material, um, we would always have an armed guard uh, at the entrance so that people that were not properly cleared couldn't come in. So much of what we did, you know, was at least somewhat classified. Our crypto gear was all top secret. You know, we couldn't we couldn't let the crypto gear get out. So yeah, we got to have armed guards. Part of our job was to keep up with the Russian fleet in the South Atlantic and in the Caribbean. Now the information that we got from messages that they sent, we didn't get to we didn't really get to see any of that. It was all encrypted. You know, we never know if the information that we gathered uh, was useful or not. We never got to see the results of any of it. Everything that we did went to NSA. I got selected to be the first Marine to teach electronics intelligence to uh, Navy and Marine Corps personnel in Pensacola, Florida. Um, that was a lot of fun. Uh, being the first Marine instructor there in the electronics intelligence building, the Navy didn't know how to deal with me. So um, it was always good to be able to be in a position to, uh, to give the Navy grief. Because that was, that was part of what Marines do, um, be the troublemaker. While I was in Pensacola and, and I got short toured there, um, I had applied for uh, the Senior Enlisted Intelligence Program in Washington, D.C., and I got selected for that. Um, so I went to the Senior Enlisted Intelligence Program at the Defense Intelligence College at DIA in Washington, D.C. We worked with the Coast Guard out of Miami and, and Key West, Florida on drug interdictions. One of our visiting professors was from the University of Texas at Austin. He was a computer guy and he developed a program. We put all the information in it. And the computer, we'd have to let the computer run for about 24 to 36 hours to filter all the information. And right now, my phone would probably do that in about two or three minutes. But the computers back then were pretty slow. But um, we, would, we would take that information that we got and we would send it to the Coast Guard. And the Coast Guard would use it. And basically what we were doing was we were telling them, these are the areas where 
your drug interdictions should be the highest. And so they're like, okay, let's check it out. And, and, it, and it was working. Their drug interdictions rose significantly. And so we kept doing that. And then when we had our, our Christmas break, we got to see drug interdictions drop. And when we came back and we started doing, running the program again, drug interdictions kind of went back up. So it just kind of solidified to us again that, that what we were doing was something that was making a difference, you know, at that time anyway. I did my last year in San Angelo, a good fellow Air Force Base there. The Marine Corps had looked at one time years before about moving their electronics intelligence school to San Angelo. And so they had some Marine instructor billets there. And while there had been no Marines there for several years at least, there was still a billet there. And so that same buddy of mine was in DC as our got transferred us everywhere. And so I was talking to him. He said, yeah, I can stick you in it. They're not going to like me for it, but it's an open billet, so I can stick you in it. And that was as close as I could get to East Texas. My grandfather was in the hospital. He was dying from uh, colon cancer. And so that's why I really pushed for that. And so um, I got to spend my last year in the Marine Corps in uh, San Angelo teaching electronics intelligence to the Air Force. And that was a shock for them. The Air Force, those guys had never really dealt with Marines in, in that capacity anyway, if they'd ever dealt with them at all. And so having having a, a Marine as an instructor was was a bit of a, a, a trip for some of them, but it, it all went well. They survived it. That was my last year in the Corps and retired in uh, September 1993. Most of, most of what I did, I really enjoyed. Obviously, there were some places that I went to that were less enjoyable, so to speak. Um, some places I did not like at all. But um, overall, I, I, I would go back and do it all again. I enjoyed what I did. Uh, I hated when I had to to leave that job, but it, it kind of got me to where I am, you know, today. Before I got into what I'm doing now, I was the veteran service officer in Cherokee County for nine and a half years. I had to leave as the veteran service officer because of all the concussions I'd had. Uh, I had reached a point to where I could no longer remember how to do my job. And it was tough when you realize when you realize you're losing your mind and there's nothing you can do about it, you kind of wonder what your future is going to be like. And I didn't see a very bright future for me at that point. 